Thank you all for coming and staying all day. Um, when we started this idea, we, we organized this on a very short um, ramp. Uh, I sort of made the decision a few weeks after ELCE, and it still took a few weeks to get things organized. And I'm really glad that you all came and made this worth everyone's while. Um, I am Philip Ballister. I've been associated with Open Embedded and the Octo Project since about 2006, uh, which kind of makes me an old man, and I feel like it. You're old. I'm old. I remember when some of you were young. <laughs> so, <laughs> this talk is partly to get me in the habit of speaking in front of an audience again, and partly to talk about Open Embedded and the Octo Project in ways that people really haven't done to date. Um, and the talk is more oriented towards a less technical audience, but I think it will still be interesting and it will probably set some background to clear up a lot of misconceptions. I know um, I was talking to Jan a few months ago and you basically get used to identifying your audience and using the word Yocto, Yocto Project, or Open Embedded, depending on who the audience is. And there's a lot of confusion there, and hopefully this explains some of it, and we just have to deal with today as it is. So, Open Embedded started out, um, historically speaking, people had these, these consumer-grade <laughs> embedded devices appeared, and people started to want to build Linux for them. So there were many disparate efforts at building Linux distributions for pieces of hardware that were appearing, you know, in the early 2000s. Um, and as Chris mentioned, there's three basic principles um, that were baked in very early in the process, in, in the cycle. And these sort of what hold Open Embedded together. And I think a lot of you have noticed that these get very blurred in the implementation, but so this is why I want to mention them here. We have a machine, which is a piece of hardware, a hardware configuration. We have a distribution, which are the policies used to uh, build the binaries and define them. These can include things like a NIT system manager, um, libc type, um, do you have X11, uh, you know, display, things like that. And finally, we have an image, which is what actually gets loaded on the hardware within the constraints of what the machine can do and the distribution. So what is the Yocto project? Um, this was kind of a weird thing. We were uh, in Cambridge in 2010 sitting underneath the Concord and this Jim Zemlin guy who's a very energetic speaker gets up and he's talking about this Yocto project thing and there's a lot of confused looks in the room um, from some friends of mine I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting, I work on that. <laughs> um, so this was the Linux Foundation's first collaborative project and anyone who's followed the Linux Foundation in the past few years, they're now made up of collaborative projects. This has become a really big thing for them and we're basically the first attempt at one. Um, it's a membership-based organization, um, so it, and it's a membership based on corporations, uh, businesses, and you you basically have to be a Linux Foundation member, and then you pay Yocto Project dues. And somewhere I built a uh, table that I don't have here showing you the costs, and it varies and it's quite dramatic at the higher levels. I would like to recognize Mr. Bruce Ashfield as representing Xilinx, who is a Platinum member. And John Mason is also, ARM is a Platinum member now. Um, anyone else in the room work for a member company? Just to recognize you all. Um, so we have silver, gold, and Platinum members. Uh, as you can imagine, the amount of money at each level. And we're really thankful to the people who actually pay the money um, because they're really at the moment providing a lot of the structure and support for the core of the project. Um, if you're familiar with the uh, OE core testing cycle, there's some fairly rigorous QA testing that goes on as they merge patches to make sure the builds don't break. 
And they also pay Richard Purdy and Michael Halstead now. Richard does most of the architecture work and does like a lot of work, far more than he is capable of doing. Um, and Michael Halstead does sysadmin work for various web services and mostly keeping the auto builders running, uh, which were very overworked machines. They've got them fairly well tuned now, but in the early few years of the Octo project, they were blowing out hard drives. Oh, Beth can tell us all about those. I mean, they were exploding hardware, figuring out how to test massive amounts of, you know, basically doing a lot of builds. I mean, there's some big matrix of builds that get done. And it's very big, and the machines run a long time, and hardware would explode. So, this is sort of the history of the early days of Open Embedded. I have no idea how long this talk is going to last. I'm practicing. <laughs> <laughs> so this is before my time. So I could well be wrong. And we had a beer with Kuhn last night. And he assured me that some of this is wrong. And uh, quite frankly, we don't need to go into the gory this details. <laughs> Thank you. This site is also copied from Wikipedia. <laughs> and I saw I saw a slide um, in a talk this this weekend that basically had this same information. I'm like, oh, good, we're all reading the same Wikipedia article. So basically, this was uh, Chris Larson, Mickey Lauer, and Holder Schurig um, were all working on similar but different projects in the same space, and. Chris and Michael work on OpenZaurus. Chris created OpenZaurus, from what I remember. Michael joined yeah. OpenZaurus, and Holger was working for a company which made own embedded PDA, industrial embedded PDA, and they had own distribution, OpenMMCI, or something like this. Yeah. And, yeah. And that is. Linear Linux was added, but they, we hope that the developer, that familiar developers will join. But it was handheld yeah. org, it was mess, and <laughs> basically familiar, familiar died quicker than others. <laughs> okay, for the microphone, we've had an interjection from the audience from somebody who remembers more of the truth than I did. <laughs> So, I, but basically what it was, was, you know, this was an actual positive thing. You've got a bunch of people doing different things who agree to start working together. And this, I think, really created a really solid foundation for the project because you had a, a diverse group of people coming together to work on something. So... <clears throat> I mentioned Richard Purdy creates the Pocky repo at Open Hand in 2005 because this will sort of knit through the story as we go forward from here. Um, Flossum is a very special thing for Open Embedded because we first had, I believe there was a developers meeting in 2006. Is that? I am just checking. Okay. <laughs> so. I showed up at Fossum in 2007 because I happened to, it looked, I mean, it just worked out that I could come. I'd started working with Open Embedded because I needed to run a software defined radio on an OMAP board. And this was the first thing I found that would make something that would boot on a board. Um, so I got mixed up. So I showed up. I was like, Belgium, I want to go to Belgium. So I went to Belgium and I show up at the beer event and I hardly know anyone there and I end up cornered by some Italians for a few hours. And the next morning, you know, I wake up with a terrible headache in the hotel, and I go down to breakfast, and, you know, I start meeting these guys. Uh, it's probably the first time I met Mark and... Um, so we had a stand, and that's when the stand was in the H building, and it was incredibly crowded and just crazy. The next year at Fosdom, we had, a, you know, a lot of excitement after having a stand and people are getting organized and so we create a German EV structure at Fosdom in the former Chi Chi's which is now the Burger King uh, down by DeBrooker the station which if you follow me on Facebook you'll notice there's a picture of the Burger King in various states over the past few years 
And we knew things were really getting serious. So we had an organization, we had a board, and someone from Monta Vista pinged me in IRC and was like, can someone call you? And I'm like, okay. And at the time I was doing some consulting work in uh, Scottsdale. And so I go out in the parking lot because I had a crappy cell phone and I end up talking to some relatively important Monta Vista person who's asking the question, do you mind if we base a product on this? And I'm like, I don't really see any reason. I don't think anyone's going to get pissed off. I remember Linus Torvalds was quoted as saying, if anyone can sell a copy of Linux for a thousand dollars, I'm all for it. I'll be impressed. I'm like, yeah, I think we pretty much all, you know, that mind. I mean, people were doing commercial work. We had open hand. Um, people are starting to pick up a lot of, you know, people are getting paid now to do things. This still was 2009, if I remember. Uh, I think you'll see in Grenoble, they had a talk. We'll uh, have to check. I, ha I have to check because I, I, was, I had the I was really surprised. Yeah, but then. the phone call may have been earlier. I have to check because I was in Scottsdale and I can probably work out when that was. So I've got a couple pictures from 2007 and we can recognize a young coon, a uh, young Richard, and you have to know it, but that's um, Holger Zeck. Yeah. Yeah. Holger, and, Richard, coon, and the one that was like can see basically. Yeah, I got a few more pictures, but this one is just funny because it's got Richard when he's very young. And for the audiences that I might try to use this talk with it in the future, they'll want to see young Richard pictures. <laughs> um, and so things are really exciting. <laughs> so, how many of you were at Fawcett this weekend? How many of you were impressed at how full the dev rooms were not? Okay, so you all thought the dev rooms were full this year. This is a room in AW, and if you look closely at this picture, you will see that there are people sitting on the floor. I, I had a guy at the SDR room, you have an entire floor you could fill. And I'm like, no, we can't. And then I showed him this picture. This is what got us trouble with a fire marshal. And if you see the windows, we have people sitting on the, completely filling the windows. We filled every square inch. And this is um, Mickey and Sean. Sean. Sean Moss Holtz, is that his name? I remembered it. And they are talking about open moco. And this was a reason why Invited Room was moved to a near next yeah. year. This yeah. exact talk. Exactly. Yeah, so there was a lot of excitement and it was all our fault. We have created something we can now build an operating system for the first open mobile phone. Oh boy, we're excited. So things went on for a couple of years. A lot of people started to get jobs. I mean, remember, this was started by a bunch of young guys and college students and people started to get jobs and things and more and more people started to use it. And along the way, Intel bought Open Hand. So they bought, basically bought Richard. Um, I refused to join Intel because they wanted me to move to Ukraine. Yeah. We know some people have standards. That looks like a good choice at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, things were pretty stable. We're holding developer meetings. You know, we have, I, we're not maybe the most good effective group organizationally. The EV had a lot of teething problems in the early years. Uh, we ended up with a set of uh, statutes where we couldn't make decisions because we had some deadlock things. So we had to have a special meeting at a Linux talk in Berlin in person to approve a voting thing over the internet. Uh, very formal. And so anyway, we all show up at ELCE. We've scheduled some space for a developer meeting as usual. And lo and behold, we all find out about the Octo project, except for some guys who'd heard about it under NDAs. And this slide is sort of very condensed. Um, in the beginning, 
Open Embedded was a member of the Arcto project. Today, as it stands, as we redid the uh, the part of the agreement with the Arcto project and all their member companies to make it look more like their current documents they use for their uh, collaborative projects. We're now listed as a technical partner, um, so we have a seat on the Octo Project Governing Board, uh, which has been me for my entire time. Um, fire, it would be interesting to change that, but I don't know how to do it. Um, because of the way things have evolved, we've ended up with two technical steering committees, and there's a certain amount of hand-waving what each one is responsible for. Um, and the way, one of the ways I try to describe this to people is Open Embedded is responsible for representing the people in the project. I don't care who you work for. You know, if you want to go up to an Open Embedded board member and complain about things, I'll listen to you as a person. Um, members of the Octo Project are representing companies and they may have different opinions about things. I've worked with, we have a lot of guys who wear both hats. Uh, Mark Hatley for years was with Wind River, he's now with Xilinx. And I'm sure you've all heard him in a developer meeting being very, very good at saying what is his you know, technical, personal opinion of what things should do. And then he'll say, and my corporate hat is going to say something completely different. Um, Meta GPL too. When we had those discussions, he was you know he knew corporately he needed to care a lot more than he did. Yes, we just don't care about GPL two because it's just a tremendous support hassle to keep those working. And yes, this is confusing, um, and it's just the way things developed over the years. I know it's caused a lot of pain for people trying to figure out when to use the word open embedded, when to use the word Yocto project. And basically my advice is don't worry about it too much. Just be sensitive that there's some rough history there. Marek. I have a question. What is your question? I just throw put into this picture. Um, Armstrong. <laughs> well, let me, let me answer so it goes into yep. the microphone and I'll be diplomatic. Enjoy, so, so basically, <laughs> Angstrom was an early binary package feed distro um, that basically was managed a lot by Kuhn. And Kuhn is one of these guys who got married, got real jobs, and has two kids. And that kind of, you know, leads to tailing off for projects that basically aren't making any money. So it basically was an early binary package distribution that received fairly wide usage, uh, especially when he could keep up with it. And it unified all open embedded derived distributions. Yeah. We we ended open Zauros because Arms, all devices went to Armstrong. We ended open Simbad and basically no one used Simbad at the time, so yeah. they don't care. But we had Simbad support for a short time in Armstrong. Same with familiar with devices supported by familiar. If they get 2.6 kernel, they were supported by Amazon. Yeah. So I, there's obviously a lot more details to the story. It's history. Yes. There's a lot of history, and some of it is best served over beer. And don't you want to talk about the EVs? EVs. Uh, the Agatha Kleiner? Uh, see, I can't pretty pronounce that, and I kind of mentioned it, um, and having to have a special meeting because we deadlocked because we couldn't do internet voting because of how we wrote the statutes or copied them from KDE. Is it, is it finally gone now? Uh, no, I need to speak. <laughs> I'm in the process. But. Yeah, we, we, okay. So aside, we have a German organization. We start out with several Germans on the board who can read the documents. At some point, the center drifted out of Germany and we end up with no Germans and one poor Dutch guy who's trying to do the German interfacing and now we have a German on the board again so we're trying to politely eliminate I mean eventually I expect to be banned from it traveling to Germany because it's some EV tax filing that doesn't get made um, so as an aside I don't think I have a slide on that if you're an open source project and people are talking to you about forming an organization, 
I would recommend looking at software in the public interest that does work for Debian, um, mm -hmm. Software Freedom Conservancy that also handles finances. It's basically handling money is hard. Handling international money is even harder. Um, you know, to take money for this event, um, we're using Pretix, which lets me use PayPal, which money goes straight to software in the public interest. This is great. I don't have anything flowing through my accounts that will look funny to the tax man. So that's sort of a aside on organizations. So what really changed after the merger of Yachtu, you know, the association, whatever you want to call it? In the good old days, we had Open Embedded Classic, and it was basically one layer growing without limit. I believe we counted 3,000 plus recipes in it. Oh, and in one directory? No, it was directory trees. It was recipes and then package name slash yeah. files. You let me give the talk. You want to give the talk next time? <laughs> <laughs> So we have one layer. So it's basically, you know, recipes core, you know, a lot of the same directories. And it just became very huge. And then there was always the controversy of how many versions of a recipe to keep. You know, this was controversial. And pretty much everyone had push access. And then you have to imagine we start on BitKeeper. And as we remember, the BitKeeper story ended very suddenly and caused a lot of pain. And since Git hadn't been invented, and we love distributed version control, we started using Monotone, uh, which was not a happy experience. No, it was not ready for us. No. I mean, we immediately broke it over and over and over. <laughs> so... Philippe, from what I remember, one of two biggest users of Monotone. Yeah. It was oh, yeah. like... One, co one project had huge database with small amount of huge changes, and we had huge amount of files with huge amount of small changes. Yeah. The side effect was, if you had a problem with Monotone, you join the Monotone IOC channel and say, hi, I'm from Open Embedded, and everyone is listening. <laughs> yeah. So, not only do we have a difficult version control situation, we have a very poor testing situation. We have a lot of developers pushing. We have people trying to do fairly commercial work who are very uptight five days of the week. And then we have the hobbyists who come home on Friday and start working. And they're angry because the commercial guys broke it Monday to Friday. And then the commercial guys are angry because they come in on Monday and everything is broken. <laughs> There's no concept of a release. So it's just constant development. So the guys doing releases would basically keep compiling until something worked. And then <laughs> snapshot. <laughs> so there was a lot of problems. And everyone is frustrated. You know, since circa 2010, everyone is frustrated. You know, Richard has disappeared into Intel. You know, he's sort of been a calming voice on and off but partly because he put Pocky in subversion so that he didn't have to deal with all the breakage. We had a lot of good cooperation back and forth, but Open Hand had basically firewalled themselves and created a thing called Pocky that became the basis for Open Embedded Core. So Open Embedded Core is now a smaller set of recipes that will basically do some basic um, embedded Linux functions, it includes SOTO for historical reasons so that they can build a graphic stack that they can, you know, we can run tests against. So basically Open Embedded Core is the heart of a Linux distribution that is small enough to be manageable and large enough to be useful for some tasks and gives you some stability to start building testing and uh, quality assurance around. So now the merge cycle consists of batching patches in master, feeding them to the auto builders for a few hours, maybe longer, and then merging sets that work. So master in open embedded core has a pretty good chance of working now at any particular hash. Um, 
it's building for several ARM, several X80s, X80, X84. Wow. <laughs> ah, ah, oh, very good. I have a typo. Um, and it builds for MIPS and PowerPC. Is this true? We try to build for MIPS. We try to build for four architectures, which I didn't mention here, which I should fix. Uh, clearly, ARM and x86 are the popular ones, or x84, as we now call it. <laughs> you, you took out your two cents. Hmm? You took out your two cents. Yes. Because <laughs> you're giving them to us. Yeah. So it's also an x8466. <laughs> it's amazing. So we have a lot more testing in OE Core, and we have the concept of release it. So now we can actually release something, and then we can only take changes against it to improve it, theoretically. Um, and recently, there's been discussion at the Octo Project level about having long term stable releases. Right now, a release is supported for basically a year, and there's been talk of doing a long-term stable release where we provide support for a longer period of time. Um, and this is partly in response to market demand for LTS releases. LTS releases are problematic, and I think there's a lot of um, confusion and hand-waving about them. And if you really want to understand LTS support, problems, look for Jan's talks at ELCEs, where he talks about this occasionally, and he will convince you that possibly LTS releases are not the best. So, it's a hard problem. So, what, what is good about this? The good about this is I'm not doing too bad on time, um, with help from the audience. So the core layers are building consistently. Um, the job market for people who know Open Embedded and the Octo Project is great. I have LinkedIn mail me the keywords on Open Embedded and, and Yocto. They insist that I get about 15 jobs a day, most of which are duplicates from the previous email. Um, but I would say, you know, each week, you know, there's half a dozen jobs showing up. Um, I don't know if it's filtering US only. I haven't really looked. Basically, it's just a keyword search to keep me aware of industry trends. Um, in fact, one of the things I will tell people, you know, what the Yocto project is. I mean, the Yocto project is a full employment program for open embedded developers. I mean, any of the guys from the good old days who still want to be in the business are. And some of them have branched into clearly other areas of Linux building. We have layers available for a broad spectrum of software. I mean, if you go to Layers Index, you can find a layer for pretty much anything. Uh, we were joking around about building Bitcoin miners yesterday um, while we were supposed to be paying attention to a talk, and a friend of mine announced his newfound respect for Open Embedded when he discovered meta cryptocurrency. <laughs> really? Yes. Really? It exists. <laughs> so Philip, does it work like Meta Builder? You like they? No, no, we're not gonna we're not gonna discuss troll layers. Uh, but you can make. No, would you be quiet? I have to finish this talk. <laughs> so basically, you can do anything you want. And walking around this room, you know, talking to people about their experiences, you know, getting jobs in this field. They found out that people can do anything they want. So the bad, <laughs> you can do anything you want. Um, in the early days, there was a company making small devices that fit in the palm of your hand that had used Open Embedded for a while. I so shortly after the announcement of the Yocto project, there was a large Yocto summit in San Francisco that I actually didn't go to because I had another conference I'd already scheduled to where they had like a meeting of the industry minds to get everybody on board with this big project. Um, and, you know, someone met some of these people that had been using this for a while and doing anything they wanted. 
And I'm sure we've all had experiences with that that lead to a lot of consulting dollars. Um, and at this point, it was getting late. And so I tossed out a couple of the things that I hear. I mean, the error reporting is horrible. Um, I know Rich was complaining. He was trying to run a demo, and he discovered that slight syntax changes lead to horrible error messages. I mean, this is really bad. I mean, we're all used to it, but this is bad. So, And we have this constant um, chatter that is just really hard to get involved with. It's hard to get started. We don't have a lot of good examples. Usability sucks. Um, so I want to leave that there as this is not something that I want to be um, just sort of accept and go on with is I really want suggestions on what can be made better. And then we're going to get into the mess of what do we do for the next 10 years? I mean, this project's been going on since 2004, which depending on how you count is like 15 years. What are we going to be doing in 10 years? Are we all going to change to something else? Um, are we going to extend Kona into doing cross compilation and building Linux distributions instead of just replacing unit binaries on existing machines? What do we need to be relevant? I mean, we seem to be doing a really good job at staying relevant. The whole container thing crops up and I've got a room full of talks, how to do containers and why we can do this. Um, we need to get new people involved. Um, I've got a slide here where we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And how do we communicate with end users? Nobody, I mean, the hardcore people are reading the mailing list. The mailing lists are hard. How many people here read at least, uh, how many people in here don't read any mailing lists, open embedded or Yocto lists? Do not. Do not. Um, how many of you read one? Two? Three? Okay, so the guy's reading two. Which ones are you reading? Come on. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm reading open embedded members. I, I know. That one is those somewhat restricted access, so I don't count that one. Um, and I got complained for promoting this workshop is that we didn't send because of another guy who only reads open embedded members at the moment. Um, so do you still count OPDEVO? Yeah, we count. OPDEVO is still... It's not related to OPDEVO. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. We got to wrap this up. And I got to go to... I have these questions. And this is another interesting slide that John put together for me. And... We can see release names. FIDO is about 2015. So each one of these releases six months apart. And we have company names. So on the left, that one is Intel. That one is Wind River. That one is this company called Gmail. <laughs> <laughs> and this one is a company called Linux Foundation, which is synonymous for Richard Purdy. <laughs> and this one is everyone else. And don't get obsessed with the company names. I mean, when the project started, there was a clearly a very heavily Intel influence. And one of the reasons that, you know, I sort of fought to keep Open Embedded a little bit independent of this whole thing is, I'm like, I've been around business for a while and worked and seen businesses have cycles and come and go. And this project clearly is going to outlast business cycles. So it's really important that you have a diverse set of businesses supporting it and a diverse group of people, um, you know, not depending on any one person. So we can clearly see Intel is very excited. And then they kind of just trail out. And yeah, we've all read the news, and Intel has business cycles. Wind River? Very flat. I mean, they're consistently good performers. They have a business model that works for them, and they have consistent engagement. We like that. Um, this Gmail guy. 
I mean, this Gmail, this Gmail is a growth business for us. I mean, I got to find out what these people make. Um, there's a suspicion that Gmail is also Camrage. Um, but, I mean, even he's not that productive. <laughs> so I think it includes, and then we have everyone else. And we can see that, whoa, everyone else. Everyone else kind of grew in and flattened out. I mean, don't read too much into these numbers, but these are interesting trends. And then we have some of the sort of consistent contributors at low levels. And that is illustrating the thing I'm trying to learn about how to talk about for this talk, is how do I sell to companies is to get more developers involved with just keeping the lights on. I mean, OE Core takes a lot of work to keep going. Uh, we see is the police. There, is there a total of all the combined? You can speak to John Mason afterwards about modifying the slide to <laughs> make your point. Um, <laughs> so my question for you is how do we motivate people to you know help fix bugs? I mean, there's this constant plea on the mailing list is please look at the stuff in Bugzilla. That covers OE Core. Then we all sit and we piss and moan about all these layers out here that are crap. And they're not going to fix themselves. And a lot of them, you know, A, they're on, they're on layers so we can remember they exist and not start from the ground again. But at the same time, sometimes it's easier to start from the ground. You know, these are all decisions we have to make. And where I need help and where the OE board needs help is getting people to actually do work. Um, I can assure you that, you know, I spend more time than I should on some of this stuff. Uh, and pretty much the rest of the guys doing board work are spending, you know, more time than they should on it. And that doesn't leave us any time to work on things like documentation, editing wikis, um, looking for, you know, bad layers that are causing people's problems. I mean... Even getting some simple builds of some of the popular BSPs and helping with keeping those up to date. I mean, these are all big tasks that people do. I mean, we're really lucky with the Raspberry Pi because I think enough people are working on it to keep it, you know, going. And it's an important piece of hardware, no matter what we think of the actual design. It's a great piece of hardware for people. And at twenty-five dollars to get an AR sixty-four is where I do all my AR sixty-four testing. So. You know, the, and so not only do we have the basic infrastructure stuff, you know, what do we want to do with this project? You know, how are we going to make it better? And how are we going to get, find people to make it more usable? I mean, because the more time, the less time we spend debugging stupid errors, the more time we can do fun stuff. And I mean, that's really what this project is all about, is doing fun stuff and not interpreting strange error messages and not fixing broken board support packages, even though we're making money from it. <clears throat> you know, it's like, you know, what I want is people to go home and think about the future of the project. And with that, I think I had a slide that said, Answer my questions. <laughs> so if you have any questions, I'll try and answer them. But, you know, really what, you know, go home, think about these things. Um, give me advice on how to say these things better. Yes, Chris. So this isn't my question. It's actually the guy who's sitting next to me who's, who's now, now disappeared. Um, would it work if we were to have a hackathon? at, uh, say, the next Embedded Linux conference. In other words, get people into a room and say, okay, we're going to develop something. You know, start hacking away and we'll come around and we'll help you. Yes. Would, would that be an intro? Does anybody think that would work? Well, I have no idea myself, but... Uh, would you should it, so? Like, people <laughs> broke because you wouldn't be able to compile everything. We've done... We've done things like this before, and I've found them effective. I mean, I certainly learned a lot um, from Graham Gregory in Berlin 10 plus years ago about just how to fix. I mean, you show up with some project that's halfway broken and just get help. 
um, we've had we've seen this work in the past it's the problem we're having the problem as I see it is you have a lot of the dot com guys who have travel restrictions you know in those days when we could make them work you know people were their own bosses and deciding what to do with their money um, I think there's there's people who would like to see that happen it's just a question of how to arrange it and make it effective I mean I'm open to a lot of ideas and I like that one it's and I think there are others who are interested in it yeah, the, 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 what was it the Dr. Summit back in the fall the, last, the second day was supposed to have some of that but then there was too many talks yeah then we got too many good talks so I mean it's Philip do you, do you envision that this would be like people who have some sort of a love and fashion like fixing vendor BSPs which are broken or how would that be? <laughs> <laughs> so the, I have mixed feelings about fixing their BSPs for free. Um, so now that we're now that we're all doing this for money, we're also getting to be a bunch of money growing um, Yeah, we've been you know, so growing some people into a room and, and uh, probably starting with the message. Yeah, the no, I mean, I, one thing I hear about, you know, today is people are learning that possibly what is happening at their companies is causing problems for people and they need to fix it. And the more ways we have of doing that, the better. Rich. So I have a proposal. Uh oh. You always have one. I do. Uh, Open Meta cre created very flexible metadata to allow people to do things that they don't want to say why they're producing. So why don't you create some metadata that specifies why things are being done? So, for example, Corporate things should have metadata. Uh, can I have some metadata that you can indicate the corporate business data? Because you'll have to explain that to me again. Well, so if, if Meta Raspberry Pi is the, the, the grassroots entry point, if a layer is for a device that costs fifty thousand dollars, like who's contributing to meta virtualization? What corporations so that they can be pumped sufficiently? Yeah, it's just kind of stakeholders, right? It's, you know, the average size is this versus this. The, the thing is flat, right? So you, you have to infer, you just have to infer the properties of the layer from things that are between folks. That's what the way is done. It makes things so flexible that you have to look at the strings to see what's inside the string to infer what it's about. So this is, you know, good and bad. Yeah, but this is the core path. Yeah. So a layer is the git log already. I mean, you can do a git log and you see all the... Well, the that, that that a lot. So that's that's just right. contributing, not who's using it. Can, can, I, can I just run through the questions and then I can turn my laptop off before the battery gets flat mm -hmm. and I can find out when we need to be out of here. Beth. I have, I have a statement and a question. You may. Um, state and question. Okay. Um, one of the problems that I think we have is no one gives a shit about their phone system. Like, oh, my, my phone runs Android, who cares how it was built? Yeah. Um, we're boring. We're, yes, we're boring. And boring, believe it or not, is a problem. Yeah. Um, my second question is, I know if on the Yachter Project insert precious metal board member thing here, not only am I supposed to be contributing money, but I'm supposed to be contributing engineering resources. Uh, I think but the I latest think document... Is, that happen? So the latest document dropped the mention of contributing engineering resources. Ah. Cool. Because it was not... It was just difficult to enforce. Did you bump up the membership cost? <laughs> uh, Alex. One of the kind of conversations we keep having in similar context is what is the age demographic of contributors? <laughs> um, uh, I know, but you know, as a corollary to that, how do uh, I hate because it makes me old, doesn't it? But how do younger people interact with technology and the internet? A lot of 20 somethings I work with, they don't read stuff, you know, they, they don't teach you all the time. Mm -hmm. but, 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it's, That's what we get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, is, is, is this at all relevant? And if so, how do how does the project engage and interest younger people? You mean like the forty-year-olds? Yeah, that's the younger. People. That's the problem I have. <laughs> um, I think we're going to have to leave that as an open question for people to answer who are much closer. I mean, I work by myself. I think maybe answer that. I'm but um, I think it's too hard. Like I didn't do this stuff when I was mm, twenty-two, and okay, what well, no, I didn't and then, so not the stuff you were guys doing, like oh, here you have an Arduino block. I was twenty years old, and I was like friends around me was like, oh my god, you do hardware again? What the hell? And I was twenty, I think, and that was really hard stuff. And then I came into university, and I had. Six other people from around, like, okay, that's the Netherlands, so this isn't that big, but like a big section of the Netherlands, which has six other guys, and we have to divide it with also FPGA, embedded, and, uh, and uh, engineering, so making robots. So, if, especially from my side, there were like a big three guys, because it was so hard to get into. It was, like, we spent a lot, a lot of time to get into this, this field. Because it's too hard. Yeah. And many people actually left because they say, yeah, I don't know, this is way too hard. It's, 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 it's the hardware, it's the software, it's the stack, how you do stuff. Okay. Just a question, what was that? Which year? Uh, I finished 2015. Okay. So, yeah. This conversation needs to continue. Yes. Um, yes. And we need to figure out how to actually figure out chunks that we can do. I'm going to the Linux Foundation Members Summit, and I basically will be going through these slides and a lot of the reactions I get from them, and try to figure out how to make it a bit more corporate. Um, thank you for letting me practice on you, because uh, it's very difficult for me to be corporate, because I've been out of corporations for over 20 years for good reason. Do we get to sign, do we get uh, feedback sheets on this? Um, so I don't have any formal feedback sheets. Uh, you may send them to me if you're uncomfortable sending them to me. I can suggest them to Jan Simone or John Mason, who are also on the board, and they will discipline me if I said anything bad. Uh, or you can just send it to board at openembedded.org uh, so that we all get it, including Dennis, who's back in the U.S., missing us all. Um, and with that... I would suggest that since we haven't been run out, we can probably slowly drift out. I'm going to try and get a hard time, which I suspect is going to be fairly soon, because I think they keep normal hours here. Um, thank you all for coming. It's been thank great. You for the amazing. Yeah. Oh, don't for me. No, I mean it's really. It's been a long, strange trip, and. It's good to see everyone so interested after all these years.